This is Matthew Kilmer out of Independence, Missouri, a proud member of the NADRA. Hello, my name is Candace. I am from Texas. I am an NADRA council member. Hi, my name is Connie. I'm an NADRA council member. Hey everybody, this is Eric from Bradenton, Florida. Uh, I'm an NADRA council member. Hello, I'm Bob Murphy. And I'm Deborah Murphy. We're part of the NADRA. We're sending 10,000 toy trucks to Washington, D.C. to send a message of unity amongst truck drivers. And the great thing is, is that Washington, D.C. can donate these toy trucks to the Toys for Tots for children. Hey guys, this is Angie from Taillights with the Bombs. I am also a NADRA council member. 10,000 toy trucks to D.C. is in full swing, but we need your help. Please go to nadra2022.com. That's N-A-D-R-A-2022.com for more information on how you can support us today. Welcome in TNC Radio dot live live on a Wednesday night. This is Taillights with the Bombs, and now here's Angie Bomb. Welcome back, everybody. I hope everybody had an awesome week. Uh, we are being joined by my friend Mike Bird, and he's actually been on the show with us once before, and he was such a great interview. I just like had to have him on again. But Mike, I'm going to give you a few minutes, just kind of introduce yourself to everybody. Tell a little bit about how you got into the trucking career, how long you've been driving, just a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm, my, my name is Mike Bird, and I've been out here for 25 years in the industry. Um, got started out here um, after, actually, uh, at the, I wasn't even supposed to go back to work, but after I was injured in the fire service, but I got tired of sitting around, not making, not having, you know, the income coming in, so I decided to choose my career, you know, said I already had my CDLs. I said, I'll just go out and do driving trucks. And I've been out of here ever since. Okay. okay. That's a heck of a change going from a first responder to a, to a truck driver. But I do know that you did mention in the last interview that your first responder training did come in handy with you being a truck driver. Cause you have come across some incidents as a driver. I've been coming in quite a few instances as a driver, and it's 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 just it's sad to, to say and, and and sad to see. Um, yeah, I, I I worked one oh probably about a month ago. A driver was I, watching him in or two months ago. He was coming down the gravel road on the side of the road, and I can see him. And he was just a moving it. You could see the the dirt pine behind his truck, and he didn't slow down. And with, instead of going around the curb, he went straight and into a tree. And killed him and injected the co-driver and killed both of them. Oh, my goodness. And oh. I'm sitting here on I-40 just watched it all happen. That's, that's got to be so hard. I know as a, a truck driver, you know, when we come across accidents like we do, and we, and we know which ones are fatalities, there's times, you know, where Larry and I are just like, oh, my gosh, I, I know that we've probably suffered PTSD because it doesn't leave your mind. How do, how do you handle that? Because you were a first responder and, and you still, you still, you know, go to accident scenes when they happen in front of you. How do you deal with that? It's, it's tricky out here. I mean, yeah. I, I, I still have guys from the fire service that will call me and check on me and stuff like that. You know, especially when I post it on, on Facebook, something happened, you know, they'll quickly call me. But, you know, it's just something you just got, it's, it's hard to say, but I, I try to put it back in my mind, you know. It's still there. I, I still, you know, it's a bit of a memory. You know, and like the last one, the two months ago, the one that I worked, you know, it was, and the guy was video chatting his wife and his wife was on the phone. You know, the phone was outside the truck and she wanted to see her husband and I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to show her her husband. Oh, you know, okay, that's, that's so sad. Yeah. I think, I think that's the one thing, especially as truck drivers, and maybe it's because we sit up so much higher and we can look down into the cars and we can see how they drive. But I think that's the thing that bothers me the most is how many people in vehicles we see that are distracted driving, like on their cell phone or, you know, just chit chatting or not paying attention on the road. And then they're swerving in and out of traffic because they're not paying attention. I mean, it, it just seems like to me, it seems like the last few years, it's just gotten more prevalent. What do you think? It, it has, you know, and it's getting more and more ridiculous here lately. You know, that's why I'm talking about retiring. Maybe at the end of the year, buying an RV and just retiring. 
I'm, I'm tired of seeing, the, you know, the stupid, the stupidness out here from other drivers to four wheelers, you know, for instance, you know, we were driving the, road the other day and we passed a big truck at night, you know, in the middle of, it was about four o'clock in the morning. We passed a big truck and he's got his TV on, on his dashboard and, you know, and he's on his cell phone at the same time. And it's like, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. And, and it's, that's, that's what causes accidents and you're not paying attention. You're, you're busy doing other things inside your truck. And it's like, what are these people teaching these guys? You I know, know. It, it, it's getting more and more scary out here. It, you know, it, it is. And, and people ain't paying attention. I mean, you know, and we're, we're not, and you know, another thing that's gets getting sad out here is we're not family anymore. You know, we we used to be able to barbecue with each other and get to get along with each other. You know, do things, but it's all a driver for themselves. It, it's it's not the same anymore. It it really is. We actually had a, a good friend of mine, James, on the show a couple of weeks ago, and we were actually just talking about that about how there's just not a good camaraderie out here anymore. I mean, there used to be a real brotherhood where everybody was out to help each other. I mean, nowadays, if you see somebody trying to back into a tight spot at a truck stop, you'll see a million people either videotaping them or watching them, but rarely do you ever see somebody hop out of their truck to help guide them in when somebody's having problems. You know, they could be a new driver. They could be exhausted. You never know what that situation is, but you just don't see drivers really doing that anymore. Well, we had one the other day where we went to, uh, to deliver a load, and I'm coming off a hill. And he, he puts his blinker on, comes off the shoulder. I mean, right in front of me. So I, a car seen what was going on. So the car, a, a four wheeler, I've never seen one do it before, but he slowed down and put his headlights on and made, made me get over. So I merged over. Well, as soon as I merged over the left lane, I got going down the road. He literally just starts coming over top of us back over into the left lane. Now he just came off the shoulder into the right lane, into my lane. Almost took out the whole side of the truck. I had to hit the brakes and let him get him down the road. I see him turn on the turn lane. So I rolled down my window. I said, Bub, what's, what's wrong with you? you know, you're driving a semi just like me. What's wrong with you? He literally gets out of the truck, pops his brakes, get out of the, gets out of the truck with, with, with something nice, shiny object in his hand and, and wanted me to get out of the truck. Oh, my gosh. And I'm like, wait a minute. It's, you just did something as an idiot, but yet you wanted me to get out of the truck with something shiny in your hand. Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, and the other thing, you know, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you see things differently, but one of the things that, you know, we've been kind of talking about is the new generation of the truckers that are out here. One of the biggest things that, you know, we've come across is, you know, a lot of them want help and you try to, you try to help them, but then they don't want to take advice. You know, it's like, oh no, I got this. I know what I'm doing. And they don't like to take advice from the older generation or people that have been out here for, you know, a long period of time trying to offer them guidance or maybe an easier way to do things. Have you ever really come across that situation? I've come across that, you know, well, I've come across where I was going to try to help a guy out. And he said, look, my daddy did it. My uncle did it. My, my grand, great granddaddy was out here. So he knew everything. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yep. I, said, well, I said, how long have you been out here? He said, two years. I said, oh, so you know everything. <laughs> yeah, that's but, what I always call them, the know-it-all truckers. <laughs> and, it's, and it's like, you know, wait a minute, you know, we learn something new every day. And if I tell you I knew everything out here on this road, if I told you I knew everything, I might as well just hang my keys up and go home because I'm going to kill you or somebody else. Oh, you absolutely. Know? That's that's my philosophy too, Mike. I mean, the day we stop learning out here is the day that we need to hang up our keys because that's when we become dangerous and complacent. It is, and you know, and that's what these. That's, but you can't tell these newer generation. We watched the lady the other day trying to back into a hole, and she couldn't even back in the hole. Problem is, is her trainer was sitting in the in the jump seat, and wouldn't even get out of the truck. Oh, she was on her. She was busy on her phone. This little woman was struggling. Yeah, I actually spoke to a woman last week who just got out of training, and she was with a trainer for three and a half months, and the first thing she said to me is, I still don't feel prepared to go out on my own as a solo driver. She's like, I'm scared to death. She goes, my trainer was too busy either chit-chatting on the phone, sleeping. She goes, I just feel that I didn't get the training that I deserve, and unfortunately, there's a lot of new drivers that feel that same way. I truly well, you, think you, there needs to if, if if you look at some of these training schools out here, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw one out there at you, CR England. Mm hmm. I don't know if you ever seen their new trucks, their new training trucks. Mm hmm. But the trainer is now training not just one student but two students. Yep. 
they have a bunk on top above the driver's seat and passenger seat, and they got a, they got a bunk bed in the back. And how are you training them guys? Exactly. How is how is he staying up long enough to train two drivers at the same time? That's my question. That's what I've been trying to figure out. Yeah, you got two how guys. Our service don't make sense. <laughs> and 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 then somebody was interviewing one one time on a program, and I don't remember where I seen it at, but I was watching a program, and they asked the trainer about it. And he said, oh, it's just about the money. Mm-hmm. He, they said, what do you mean? He said, it's just about the money. He said, they said so it's not about helping anybody. He goes, he goes, heck, I get good money for training two students. Oh, yeah. So okay. you, now you're telling me that you're not training them. You just want the money, and you just want them to get on down the road. What well, well, happens your family's going down the road, and this student, because you didn't train them right, runs over your family? Yeah. And I'm sorry, but no student should ever walk out of being trained and be scared to go on their own. They should be walking out of there feeling confident, like, I can do this. And unfortunately, there's so many truck drivers now, they walk out and they're like, I just feel like I haven't been prepared. I'm not, I, don't, I don't know what to do. And I just think that's scary that they're turning these drivers out on the road and saying, okay, go on your own now. <laughs> you know, it's like somebody called me the, a, a rookie the other day because I, they said, man, you said you're scared about going up, in the, in, up north on 80 and all that up there. I said, look, I've been out here for a long time, and it's not the snow that bothers me. It's, it's not the ice that bothers me. The snow and ice don't bother me. I can drive in it. But it's the idiots who are in it that bother me. Yeah. And, I'm, I, and, I, and, I, hate, and, and I hate to put it that way, but it's the idiots who drive in it. They have no – a lot of these new guys don't have no training. They come out here. They train in the summertime. And mm-hmm. think they know everything, and then they get on the snow and ice, and they they go on on the, on this wrecking bench. I don't want yeah. no part of it. <laughs> yeah, and I especially uh, up in Wyoming, when you're having to deal with not only snow and ice, but a lot of times you're dealing with high wind. It does not make for a good combination. It, it don't, and then you get these new drivers on top of all that, and it's like, okay, <laughs> where are they going? <laughs> yeah, Why are they exactly. slowing down? You know, I, I'm, I'm doing, you know, I'm in the snow, you know, in a snowstorm, and I'm doing like 30 mile an hour trying to find a safe place to park, and I get this idiot come by, going by me like I'm standing still. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I hate that. It always scares me when they go past me going so fast. When I'm in bad weather like that, I'm going to slow the heck down, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm going to find a place that I can pull over because it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. No load is worth your life or somebody else's. No, it's, we're it's not. Take- We're going to take a quick commercial break here, and we'll be back in just a few minutes with Mike. You are listening to Taillights with the Bombs. Roadside safety tips for truck drivers. It's expected as a truck driver that you're going to have to pull your truck to the roadside at some point in your career. Tires blow out, accidents happen, and trucks break down. Here's some roadside safety tips for truck drivers to help you handle this situation. When you're on the side of the road, be sure to have safety equipment including flashers, cones, reflective triangles, and maybe even road flares to alert other drivers. Unless your truck is unsafe to be in, stay inside to avoid being out near the roadway. If you need to open your driver's side door, check before to make sure nothing is coming up the road. Do not roll your windows down if your truck is in idle. Fumes could come in through the open windows. Make sure to keep plenty of supplies in your truck in case you're stuck for a while. Check out our blog with items for emergency trucking safety equipment to have on hand. Five common health hazards truck drivers face. A healthy lifestyle is often overlooked by most truckers. Due to work conditions in the trucking industry, it's difficult for truckers to live a healthy lifestyle. Living on the road makes it hard for truckers to prioritize their health. Truck drivers have limited access to healthy food, lack of sleep, and exercise. Due to their work and living conditions, truck drivers statistically have more health problems. It's important for truck drivers to be aware of the common health hazards they face. To live a long, healthy life, truckers will have to focus on their health and make a conscious effort to be healthy. Sleep apnea Sleep is crucial for truck drivers. Lack of sleep can make driving dangerous. A study shows that long-haul truck drivers obtain less sleep than the required amount for alertness on the job. Truckers need a good night's sleep to be fully alert and ready to take on the road the next morning. Getting a good night's sleep is crucial for keeping a truck driver alert and productive. Truck drivers travel several hundred miles each day. To reach their destination on time, they'll have to prioritize sleep so they can be alert and ready. Obesity 
When you live in a tiny truck cab and drive for 11 hours a day, it becomes increasingly difficult to maintain a healthy lifestyle. As a result, obesity is a terrible problem that American truck drivers face. According to the American Dietetic Association, 86% of truck drivers are obese. Healthy food is hard to come by while driving and working on the road. Truck stops offer greasy, high-calorie food rather than healthy fruits and vegetables. It's important for truck drivers to be conscious of what they eat. There are many other health risks that come with fast food and truck stop food. High blood pressure, also known as hypertension, is a silent killer of both your health and trucking career. A poor diet, smoking, obesity, lack of exercise are causes of high blood pressure. Truckers need to be aware of the causes of high blood pressure and take necessary steps to avoid them. Not only does high blood pressure put your life at risk, it can also disqualify you from driving. Truckers with stage 3 hypertension, that's 180 over 110, are automatically disqualified. Depression Truck drivers spend a significant amount of time away from home and their loved ones. They also work alone for 11 hours a day. It's not uncommon for truckers to start to develop symptoms of depression. Truck driving's not an easy job. It comes with a lot of stress and anxiety. Depression not only affects a person mentally, it also affects you physically. Depression affects your energy levels, any amount of sleep you get. It can also cause a change in appetite, headaches, and muscle aches. It's important for truck drivers to consider their mental health as well as their physical health. This blog on TNCRadio.live is brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. You're listening to TNCRadio.live. Remember to tune in to the Truckers Network Show with Shelley Johnson. Weekdays at 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. TNCRadio.live, your commercial driver navigation station. Welcome back in TNC Radio Live. This is Taillights. Here's your host, Angie Baum. Welcome back, everybody. We've been talking with my friend Mike Bird. He's been a truck driver. He's been out here for about 23 years, and we were just talking about all the changes that we've seen in the industry. And one of them, of course, was the camaraderie of the brotherhood of Mike's truckers, which, you know, I, I kind of was talking to a friend of mine the other day about that, and I think part of the reason. You know, everybody's kind of got the owe me attitude and don't really want to help anybody out. I think technology's got a lot to do with it. I mean, everybody's so stuck in their phones, stuck in technology. Nobody really likes to talk to any people or offer help or assistance. It seems like that's ever since technology became such a thing in the trucking industry, I think it's become a real hindrance. Yes, it has. And I think the funniest part is when we watch all those shows about truck drivers who have uh, followed their GPS and gone into cornfields or gotten into bad situations because they don't know how to read a map and they strictly rely on their GPS. You know, uh, my, my GPS will put me in places that I ain't supposed to be. Yes. You know, and, but, but they say it's a truck driver GPS. Yes, and I'm like, us too. Uh, I'm like, or, or it takes me about 20 miles out of, out, out of route to put me back to where I need to be. Yes. And it's like, okay, what, what is, what's going on here? You know, you update your GPS, you do all this stuff, and then it still acts up on you. Absolutely. I, and I think that's one of the important things that needs to be taught in training is that yet while GPS is a great innovation and it comes in super handy, like you're saying, a lot of times it'll send us down those routes that, you know, a tr there's no way a truck could get down there, whether it's a low bridge, you know, or a weight clearance issue, or just signs that simply say no trucks allowed. It's like people need to also know how to, you know, navigate with maps, do it the old school way. <laughs> But they, but they don't get trained that way anymore. Everything's trained no. by your GPS or, you know, Googles or, you know, and it's like, why? Mm -hmm. Get the old map out, learn, learn that map, study that map, learn how to use that map like we did back in the day because we didn't have GPS. We had a map. That's all we had, you know, and you guys will figure things out because everything in that map is going to tell you low clearances. Everything's going to tell you, you know, your hazmat routes. It's it's going to tell you, it's going to tell you everything. Absolutely. You know? But nobody wants to pick that map up. It's too hard. 
Yeah. It's all about convenience and time. <laughs> that, that's all it's about. You know, you hand, you hand, you know, I can pretty much tell you where all these roads go up and down and, and here and there, you know, because we've been on them so long. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's, it's not much where I, sometimes I have to pull out a map to take a look and see where I'm going. Yeah. B- because I've never heard of town before. You know, and then sometimes in the map, it's not even there. It's, but it's between that area. <laughs> you know, if I can use the Google map to figure out where it's at, then I can, look in, I can reference it with the map, and then I can, I can figure out where I need to go. Yeah, so absolutely. It, it, but the newer generation ain't taught all that anymore. The newer generation is taught GPS and Google. Yep. What would, be, what would be one piece of advice coming from you, someone who's been on the road for 23 years? What would be a piece of advice you would give to a new trucker out here? What would be your biggest piece of advice? The biggest piece of advice? Mm-hmm. <laughs> wow, there's, there's so much to list on that one. You know. <laughs> I know. And a couple things came to mind when I said that. Yeah, I mean, because I mean, one of the biggest things that I, I that I try, you know, I, I always want to tell people is buy a map. I mean, let's go back to the GPS. Let's buy a map, learn mm-hmm. it, you know. And if you still need directions, you know, do like we did in this old school days. Don't don't be afraid to call the customer, get directions into a yeah. place, because then you're not going to put yourself out there into a hazardous hazardous a hazardous situation. Because when you start going slow and you can't figure out your GPS, you're going to go really slow down the road and you're going to cause an accident. Yeah, and then you're focusing more on the GPS than you are on the road. And we see that happen all the time, too. You know, and that's, that's the biggest advice I can give somebody. Buy a map. That's, you know, that's a great... And, and people say, well, you're, you're wrong for that. No, I'm not. Because you can, you, you'll see it. You'll see these guys on their... On, and I've done it quite a few times. Man, I, I pull up my phone and I got to pull up the address on Google because I can't figure out my GPS. Mm-hmm. And, and I've got to stop to realize, Mike, <laughs> you're acting like one of them. You, you, you have to do it the old school, the way you were taught the old school way. Yeah. You know, and if you, if you can't figure it out, call the customer. Yeah, we because, do that because, all the time. <laughs> I would rather call the customer and get there safely than possibly going the wrong way or getting myself stuck on a a street that, you know, trucks don't belong on. And then what do I do? I have to back out of a bad situation. So, yeah, we call the customers all the time. If we can't figure out where we're supposed to go or if there's a question about it, I'm not going to hesitate to call the customer and be like, hey, we've got a pickup or a delivery from you. What's the best way to get into your place? <laughs> I mean, because a lot of uh, like the GPS, and I'm, I'll, I'll be straightforward. GPS is good in certain things, but like my GPS, I've got a Randy McNally, but you get up to Chicago. Indiana, big cities like that, it does not find a customer. Mm-hmm. It'll, put you, it'll put you in a neighborhood quicker than, than, than it's not on a rail, you know, <laughs> and that's why I say, you know, if you can't figure it out, call the customer. Yes. Hey, well, I'm at, I'm, I'm at such, such street. I'm, I'm, I know I'm close, but my GPS is telling me to go in the neighborhood and I'm not comfortable going into a neighborhood. Where are you at? And they, and you nine times out of ten, you know, not, well, I'm going to say nine times out of ten because I've had one that will tell you that all she does is go from work to home and to Walmart, and that's all she goes is she doesn't know where you're at. <laughs> but you know, but if you find somebody that knows the area that's been there for over twenty years, he's going to walk you right into that customer. Absolutely. Well, since we were speaking about how long you've been in the trucking industry, you've seen a lot of things come and go, and a lot of changes. Like now, everybody's having to do the ELDs. One of the changes that we know is coming around the corner is the speed limit mandate. And so the FM, FMSCA has said that they are looking into imposing speed limiter mandates on all trucks. And they're supposed to be announcing what the speed limit could possibly be in June. What are your thoughts on having to have a speed limiter mandate for all trucks? Well, I mean, they, they did a speed limiter a, while, a couple of years ago where, 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 where it was like 55 miles an hour. And they found out that that wasn't mm-hmm. working because we were all congested in one area. I don't really mm-hmm. think they need to do that because you, you put a speed limiter on all these trucks and we're all at the same speed. It's going to either cause, A, backups, or, two, it's going to cause accidents. Yeah. Because these cars are going to try to figure out how to get around you. You're going to try to get around, try to figure out how to get around a slow truck, and then now, you, now you're both stuck out there and you're both going the same speed. It, it, it's it's going to be worse than what what you ever think it's going to be. 
And yeah, I, 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 I really don't think they should put any kind of speed limit on any kind of truck. No, you know? I agree. And I always use the analogy of California, for example, because maybe a lot of the regular uh, drivers out there don't know, but in California, the speed limit for all trucks is 55. However, the highway speed limit for passenger vehicles is 70. So that's a 15 mile difference. And it, 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 causes, it causes issues all the time in California. So when you think about doing that across the country, I just think that we're opening up a can of worms that is going to be a nightmare. Well, the thing is, okay, we'll go back to California. And a lot of people don't understand this. California actually changed the speed limit for big trucks several years ago. But they, until they post that new speed limit, we still got to do 55. But if you're in an open area, as I, I, was, I was talking to a state trooper about it, you can do the swift speed. Instead of okay, doing what's 55, that? It, I don't know. What, what he says is you can do, instead of doing 55, you can get away with 60, but nothing over mm. 60. But, you know, but I'm looking at the, you know, I look at that, okay, where if, if we all, if, they, if you know you all can do 60 miles an hour, or, you know, even 55, we come up to a hill, and guess what we're doing? We're mm -hmm. side by side again. And now these cars are getting mad, they're hitting the brakes, they're blowing their horn. You know, I've, I've watched cars pass people on shoulders because they can't get around two big trucks. Yes. You know, that's going to start inhibiting danger. Yeah. More and, and people, I, I'm, more people are going to get killed. More more people yeah. are going to get killed. You know, and, and, it, it, it's stupid. Well, and like you were saying, I, I do think it's going to incite more road rage. It's like I understand that we're a hindrance to, to cars, especially like you're saying, when we're trying to pass another truck and we just can't get the speed or whatever. And But I think that if, we are all limited to a certain speed limit. I think that it may cause, you know, more incidents of road rage against truckers because truck, you know, vehicles are going to get so upset with us. Yeah, where they can do 70, 75, and if we're governing at, say, 65, you know, and that's all the big trucks can do, now, now, now we're just going to cause them to be more angry. Yes. Heck, they, don't, they already don't like us anyway. <laughs> Let's add <laughs> another problem to the situation, and it's not us, it's the government. Exactly. It's not our fault. <laughs> it's you know, like not I, our fault when trucks govern. <laughs> well, you know, I, I look at it, the government needs to get out of get out of trucking. You know, we're we're so we're so regulated by government rules. You know, and it's it's just causing more and more and more issues every single day. You you, you take you take the government out of the situation and maybe we might be able to do what we have to do out here. Yeah, you know? I, I agree. You know, everybody's complaining about fuel prices and, you know, rising and this and that. And then, you know, they're, and then they wonder why our, our prices in the grocery store are going up. It's because of the government regulations. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just people, micromanaged too much. Yeah. You, you take the micromanagement out of everything and make it like it used to be, and we'd be doing fine. Absolutely. And the, the, the economy will go back to where it was at. Yep. We're going to take another quick commercial break, and we will be back with our friend Mike Bird. You are listening to Taillights with Bombs. Be sure to listen to Building Strong Minds with Dr. Chris, Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central, right here on TNCRadio.live. Hi, I'm Dr. Christopher Cortman, and now for the Mental Health Minute. I promised you in part one of this video that we talk a little bit more about enabling versus helping. Let's pretend that you have a son and this son has a wife and two kids and he's working two full-time jobs and sometimes has a third gig whenever he can. And you say to this son, I'd like to help you get in your first house. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to match every dollar you can come up with. And together we'll put a down payment for you on a new house. Are you helping or enabling? Most people would say helping. He's doing everything he possibly can. But you also have a daughter. She's in her fifth semester of college. She's a freshman. And she's kind of taking her sweet time, dropping classes. And she's only compiled about 12 credits thus far. And she says, Daddy, 
The lease is up. I need you to sign for me again for this wonderful plush apartment. Sounds like an opportunity to enable to me. Why? Because she's not doing everything she possibly can to help herself. That's probably where a parent has to step in and say, time to come home and let's go to community school or some kind of a change because I'm no longer willing to enable. In my book, Your Mind, an Owner's Manual for a Better Life, I wrote a little ditty on enabling. And it goes something like this. When you call him in sick, he's been drinking with Rick, that's enabling. When she's living for thrills, you've been paying her bills, that's enabling. I know what you're thinking. Keep your day job, Corbin. But here's the thing. Help people as long as they're doing everything they can to help themselves. Otherwise, stay out of the way and let them do what they can to help themselves. The Hotshot Secret Facebook page gets a lot of robust Q&A about diesel problems and their solutions. We listen to our customers. Here are their words straight from their mouths about Hotshot Secret Everyday Diesel Treatment. Our fans call it EDT. I'm John Sharp, a.k.a. J. Sharp, from Newburgh, Pennsylvania. Using EDT, my local fuel mileage went to average of 22 to 23, and my highway MPG went to... 26 to 28. Hi, I'm Danny. I'm from Arizona. I drive an O2 Ford Excursion. I use EDT at every fill up, and my mileage went from 12 and a half miles to gallon to 14 miles per gallon. I highly recommend it. Everyday Diesel Treatment delivers a six in one premium fuel treatment for every fill up, every time. Everyday Diesel Treatment is available at truck stops, tractor supply, O'Reilly's Auto Parts, and online at hotshotsecret.com. Hot Shot Secret, powered by science. Freight leaders challenge their people not to stop at the first right answer. Tighten the Lug Nuts is the book that will help you move past that first right answer to be more effective, more productive, and more successful. This book serves as a blueprint that can be easily applied by leaders, entrepreneurs, truckers, owner-operators, all of us in our everyday lives. This is one of the best leadership books you can read to help you accelerate towards your personal and professional goals. Plus, a portion of the proceeds will be donated to truckerschristmasgroup.org. Visit tightenthelugnuts.com to order your copy today. Welcome back in TNCRadio.live. This is Taillights with the Bombs. Well, at least one of them. Here's Angie. <laughs> 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 Welcome back, everybody. I just want to remind everybody that coming up next, we have got Anderson and Banker and Clutch Time Sports. So if you're a sports fan, please be sure to stick around. That is also always an awesome show to listen to. We've been talking with my friend Mike Bird, and one of the things we kind of touched on, but we, we, we really didn't go too much into detail, was before you were a truck driver, you actually were a first responder. You were a fireman and a paramedic. What made you decide to go into that field initially? Well, with being a firefighter and paramedic. Mm-hmm. Well, I've always wanted to do something with, with you know, with my life. Uh, growing up in foster homes and stuff, you know, I've, I, I, I've been around, you know, where people would help me out, you know. So I figure, what better way to help somebody else out is by uh, going into the medical service and the fire service. Absolutely. I mean. It- I'm sure the stories that you could tell it's just crazy. What What do you think was probably one of the most rewarding uh, stories that ever happened when you were a first responder? I don't know. I mean, I mean because I, I had so many calls, so I don't know which one would be rewarding and which one wouldn't be rewarding. I mean, we we try we try we try to do the best we can to help everybody, but there's some things you just can't help people with. You know, right. I mean. I, I guess one one of the thing, things that I, I can remember, you know, was, uh, you know, helping a little kid out with with, uh, well, he had cancer, and we made him an honorary firefighter, you know, Aww. and just, and, to, and to see and see a smile on his face, you know, and and you know, and live out his his, his dream, you know, with the fire department, you know, and 
honoring his last wish, you know, and where he wanted a firefighter funeral, and we given it and given that to him, you know. Oh, and we're, that, that's we're, we're, you know all of all of us firefighters, even the women got involved, and we all, you know dispatchers, and we all shaved our heads, you know, to raise money so we can you know help pay the hospital bills for his family. You know, that's something I'll always remember. Well, and that's the thing, you know, he's a first responder, paramedic, a police officer. And the calls that you guys go out on don't always have a happy ending. So when you do have a call, you go out, you know, has a happy ending for this. And, or get a little boy's and, Angie, I'm sorry. Uh, and, Angie, Angie, sorry, you're breaking up real bad. Yeah. I'm having trouble hearing you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Am I any better now? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay, there you sorry are. About that. <laughs> sorry about that. No, I was just saying that, you know, a lot of times when you're a first responder, you know, you, the outcomes aren't always good. So it's nice when you have a rewarding outcome and something turns out good or you make a, a positive difference in someone's life. It is, you know, you, we, that's what you, you try to do. You know, you got the bad calls and you got some good calls, you know, but, you know, but you try to make the best of that of every single one of them. Absolutely. Is there anything you miss about being a first responder now that you're a truck driver? I know they're two completely different fields, but is there something that you just like, man, I really wish those days. I miss doing that back in those days. You know, before, before the accident where I lost my my two brothers, you know, firefighters and the accident I was in and where I was, where I'm now disabled, you know, it's, there's, there's days I just want to go back, you know, because, you know, I, I, I miss it. You know, I'm, I'm, miss helping people yeah you know you know and i guess i I, i'll I'll, that's why i take it out here you know and and try to do the what i can out here to help people you know it's you know not all the time can you help somebody but you can try you know that's Mm -hmm. why i always go back you know you know i wish you know these drivers out here would learn cpr cpr is the biggest you know, since this month here is the heart heart month, you know, I, I wish drivers would start take more more and more serious and learn CPR and first aid. That is you know? crazy. You said that Larry and I were just talking about that. I used to be my my certification expired, and we were just talking about going and getting recertified in first aid and CPR for that very reason. We were just talking about that. Well, you never you never know the situation. You, I mean. You you can you know do CPR without you know having to breathe it breathe for somebody you know you can actually do the hands on CPR you know but it, you know and you really don't need to be certified to do CPR but it helps it helps so that way you know what you're doing the right way you know Absolutely. people say you know I hear a lot of stories well you you can't really hurt somebody while you're doing CPR well yes you can mm-hmm. you, you got you, you got to be very careful with what you're doing and you got to know how you're, you're doing it right you know. I hate when people say, "Well, you know, you know, no, you know, there's more to it than what you what you think it is." But we can walk you through it. <laughs> we're, you yes, know, we we can tell you how to do it the right way. And, and I think you brought up a really valid point, and that was, I think it would be, I think it would be an amazing thing if more truck drivers had first aid and CPR training. Because honestly, when an accident happens on the road, nine times out of ten, a trucker is usually the first person to get there before a first responder is. So by truckers having that training, my goodness, could we make a huge difference? Well, you see, that's why I, I carry rubber gloves. I, I've got a medical kit in here, but I carry rubber gloves too, because you don't want to get up on a scene and start touching people with blood all over them, you know, because you don't know what they have and stuff like that, you know. And I try to tell people to carry, carry rubber gloves in the truck just just in case, you know. You don't never mm-hmm. know. What bothers me is when you see truck drivers or people coming up on a scene. You know, before anybody's there, they're always trying to move the patient. And that's something I always try to explain to people. Don't ever move the patient. Unless the car's on fire, just leave the patients alone. Absolutely. You know, because you can do more damage than good if you're going to start pulling them out of the car. Exactly. Unless the scene is dangerous, you should never, ever move a patient. And that's why that's, that's something I've always, I've always voiced my opinion on, you know. You don't want to move the patient. The best thing you can do is hold C spine, hold hold her neck, don't let her move. Yeah. Man, you know, could because, that, huh? It would just be amazing if if that was a requirement of truck drivers that you had to get CPR and first aid trained. That I just think that could make such a huge difference to all the accident scenes we come across. Well, you know, it's like AEDs. I wish you know there there would they would uh, 
teach truck drivers how to use the AED, you know, mm-hmm. and, and carry them in the trucks. I think that should be a mandate. They, they should, they, an AED machine should be in the, in the truck. Absolutely. You know, I came across a, 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 a couple of years ago, I came across somebody one time having a heart attack. And their wife pulled, pulled over and she was waving her arms, you know, and I thought, you know, and I watched everybody driving by. So she, you know, she tried to jump out in the middle of the road, trying to get people to stop. Well, when I stopped, I, you know, I tried to figure out what's going on. And she said, my husband, and he collapsed in the passenger seat. He was having a heart attack, you know, AD yeah, machines, those- machines would work being in this truck. Absolutely. You know? And that, I mean, that's why that, that's why I voiced my opinion about CPR and first aid with these truck drivers. Everybody should be, you know, should have some kind of training. I, I couldn't agree with you more. So I was going to ask you: I, you've been all over the country. Is there a particular place in the United States that's like your favorite place to drive in? Arizona. Me too. <laughs> It, yeah, I, 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 I like I like I like you know going up and you know when I, you got to deliver out in the mountains of Arizona and, and it's getting out to the sunset and you watch the sun coming down or even the sunrise and the mountains change colors on you. you yeah, know, there's it, nothing it, like a sunrise or a sunset in Arizona. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and especially when you get the rock formations, they'll start changing color. You know, and it's, it's just the most peaceful mining you know thing you you can see relaxing now i know you're a solo driver so this is a good question for you one of the things we know as truck drivers period is the loneliness out here on the road and especially when you're gone from your loved ones for you know long periods of time how do you handle the loneliness well i'm I'm, I'm, I'm not lonely anymore my my old lady rides with me now but before you know it's just when i when i was out here by myself i mean it was kind of hard because you didn't have any, you know, you only call home or, you know, you'd call somebody up and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard situation to be alone, you know? So you listen to music, you just try to put your mind somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. You know, so this, this job is not meant for a lot of people because they can, they need, they can't be, they can't handle being away from family, you know, because you're gone weeks at a time and, you know, I was, I was I was telling a driver one time. I said, "You got to learn how to be married to the truck when you're out here. This will be your first wife, and your second wife's at home." That is a well, really good description, Mike. He said, "He said, well, that's that, that that's that's not right." And I said, "Well, that's what it is. You're married to this truck, and you're married to the roads right now." You know, mm-hmm. I said, <laughs> "You know, your 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 wife comes second. You know, at, at the house. You know, she's sitting at home." You know, I mean, you get to spend time with her, what, three or four days out of the week? And I said, the rest of the time you're married to that truck, you're on the road. You know, and if you can't handle that, then you might as well get out of the trucking. Yeah, I think anybody that gets into the trucking industry has to be okay with having a lot of time by yourself, even as a team driver. I mean, I'm by myself for, you know, eight, nine hours a day. And you have to be okay with that and be able to keep your mind occupied because if you're not able to handle that, then trucking is not the industry for you. Well, before Mama was on the truck, you know, it was like, you know, well, now that she's on the truck, you know, I'll put it this way. Well, now that she's on the truck, you know, our, our alone time is when she goes and takes a shower. I, I give her that space. Yep. Because it, because having a spouse in the truck, it get up under your skin. You know, <laughs> you get up under each other's skin, you know, and it's going to happen. Yep. But, you know, when she gets in that shower by herself, she's, she's, she can relax and, and, you know, and her mind goes somewhere else, you know, until she gets back in the truck. And it, it's a space saver for both of you. That's exactly yeah. what we do, too. We, we do the same thing. It's like, that's my time alone to decompress. <laughs> and that's what, that's what she needs, you know, because, and a lot of drivers are like, oh, no, I'll take my wife in the shower with me. Why? Give her her yep. space. Because Absolutely. she needs it. You know, if she goes back there and goes to sleep, hey, I guess I'm on there by myself, you know, and I've got to go down the road. But that's her, that's her time. Yep. We're going to take another quick commercial break, Mike, and we'll be back here in just a few minutes. You are listening to Taillights with the Bombs. As a professional driver, the engineers at Front Lane know that you remain focused on the road regardless of weather and traffic conditions. That's not always true of the drivers behind you. 
Every nine minutes, another commercial vehicle is rear-ended by a driver failing to control their speed. And guess who gets the blame? When you have to brake quickly, Tailbone illuminates a series of bright LED lights that allow the driver behind you to react up to 50% faster. Using amazing accelerometer technology and a battery that will last for years, Tailbone meets the standards set by the NHTSA and the FMCSA. Learn more by visiting www.frontlane.com slash tailbone. That's www.frontlane.com slash tailbone. Approved in all 50 states, it's Tailbone by Frontlane. This blog on TNCRadio.live is brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. Six safety tips for truck driving in hot weather. Driving in the heat can create dangerous situations for truck drivers. Drivers need to take specific precautions before hitting the road in extreme heat. With the incoming heat wave dubbed as a heat dome by the National Weather Service, drivers need to be aware of how to safely drive in these weather conditions. Follow our six safety tips for truck driving in hot weather. Every truck driver needs to complete a pre-trip inspection before driving, especially in hot weather. Check tires. Heat can have a huge effect on your tires. As the temperature increases, so does the air pressure in your tires. During the hottest months of the year, it's important to frequently check your tire pressure. Frequently checking on your tires can save you from a blowout. To get an accurate measurement, wait for your tires to cool down before checking the pressure. The heat and friction from the road cause your tires to warm up, which will cause a rise in tire pressure. Also, don't be afraid to take a break every couple of hours to let your tires cool down. While traveling in the summer months, you may want to give yourself some extra time to stop and check on your tires. Protect your engine. Not only should you protect yourself from the heat this summer, but you should also protect your engine. One way to keep your engine from overheating is to frequently check the engine oil. The oil keeps the engine cool and keeps the parts running smoothly. Engine coolant is just as important as engine oil. Coolant helps prevent the engine from overheating in extremely hot temperatures. Keep an eye on the coolant temperature gauge while driving. If the gauge goes above the safe temperature, pull over and see what's going on. Failing to assess the situation could lead to engine failure. Also make sure to check for leaks in the hoses. A cracked hose could lead to engine failure. Tips to protect yourself from hot weather. It's just as important to protect yourself during extremely hot weather. Follow these steps to keep yourself cool and safe during these hot months. Stock up on water. As the temperature increases, you need to increase your water intake. Make sure to always have water in your truck. You never know when you might get stuck in traffic or break down on the side of the road. Wear sunscreen. Many truck drivers forget this step. Even when you're in your truck, you're still exposed to the harmful UVA rays from the sun. Make sure to put sunscreen on before hitting the road. Wear light-colored clothes. Light-colored clothing reflects light, and dark-colored clothing absorbs it. Wearing light-colored, loose-fitting clothes helps you stay cooler and more comfortable on the road. And be sure to check out our blog, Six Safety Tips for Truck Driving While Driving in the Rain. This blog on TNCRadio.live was brought to you by the Truckers Network at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. It's Landline Now, followed by Steve Summers' Overnight Drive every night on TNCRadio.live starting at 11 p.m. Eastern and 10 p.m. Central. Do you feel like you're facing more than just the physical road ahead of you? Are you wondering if there's more to life? Join Ron Frazier, the host of Trucker's Life Radio, every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, where he discusses the spiritual side of a driver's life. On the show, he goes through the spiritual and moral questions drivers face on a daily basis, helping you, the driver, as you travel life's highway. Welcome back to TNCRadio.live. This is Taillights with a bomb. Here's Andy. <laughs> I love that a bomb. <laughs> uh, we want to. I just wanted to make a little quick announcement. Uh, yesterday there was a hazmat spill in Tucson, Arizona, and the I-10 has been closed due to that. But we do want to announce that the 
westbound lanes are open right now. They just reopen. And eastbound has a closure, but it's only about a mile long, and there is a reroute in place. So if you're having to go through Tucson on the I-10, you should be able to get through now. So that's going to be some great news for a lot of our travelers going through the Arizona area. We've been talking with Mike Bird just a little bit, and we've only got a few more minutes left in this episode, but I just kind of wanted to touch base and say, what is one thing if you, you know, had a magic wand that you would love to see maybe different in our trucking industry right now? What would I, if I had a magic wand? Yeah. <laughs> these, these freight rates. Oh, get, yeah. Get, get, get these, getting these brokers to stop doing what they're doing. You know, looking at uh, some of these load boards and these freight paying a dollar ten a mile to a dollar fifteen because the broker wants to keep money in his pocket and needs to stop. You know, that's, that's, that's the that's the biggest thing that I would I would, I would want to change. It would be nice to see if maybe if we could slow down on, on regulating us truck drivers so much and maybe look into regulating the freight brokers a little bit. I bet you things would make a big change in our industry. <laughs> Well, that's that's what I, that's what I want, you know. The regulations yeah. on these freight brokers, and, and get the regulations off us because these brokers are are skimming the, the pie, you know. Mm-hmm. And they're 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 not regulated. They can do whatever they want, you know, and get away with it. And you know, where us truck drivers can't, you know, and it's hurting the industry. It's hurting, you know, us. We're we're the lowest paying people out in the United States, and a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that truck drivers just make a ton of money, but especially if you're an owner operator, you have to take into account all the expenses that come along with, you know, owning and operating a truck, not to mention the fuel costs, the insurance, everything else that goes along with it, plus all the licensing and mandates that we have to go through. It's like when you add all that up, the profit margin is not that much. Well, you know, I, I found a you know I've been going through truck uh, trucking companies to trucking companies. I found actually a good one I'm working with now. It's called uh, Keep Trucking LLC out of Chicago. You know, I get paid you know seventy five cents a mile, and you know they they treat me right. They give me a new truck, a new trailer, you know, and you know I get the miles. You know, That's and the, 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 and these these trucking companies out here, they're promising all this big pay. They're not giving the drivers the pay that they need. You know, they, they keep them out, out about eight, eight, nine hundred miles to fifteen hundred miles a week. And yeah, you're that good pay, but they shut, they shut your mileage down. You yep. know, and well, Mike, I, I think, I, I think that needs to stop too. <laughs> I, I can't agree with you more. Mike, it has been such an awesome pleasure having you on the show again. This is the second time we've had Mike on here, and I just love having you on here. I really appreciate you being on. Um, I did want to remind everybody before we get ready to go is stick around because Clutch Time Sports is next with Anderson and Banker. That is one of our favorite shows. Larry and I try to listen to it every week. If you are a sports fan, you don't want to miss it. And we want to remind everybody that we'll be back here next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Central. And next week, we actually have a very special show. We're going to have uh, some members from TIER, which is an organization for real women in trucking. And we're going to be talking to them about their nonprofit organization and how they help truck drivers in the trucking community. So, Mike, I just and, want to thank you again so much. And, and no problem. And like I said, next time that you want to invite me back on, uh, I, I do want to bring up a discussion with you. Uh, but I'll, I'm going to text you about it and, and see what you think, and maybe we can do a show on it. Oh, I would love that, Mike. Guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, we will make it happen. That, yeah, because there's something I really want to bring up, and I want to see we are, what we can do about doing it. But I will text you all the information about it first. Okay. And see what you think. Sounds perfect. Also, I want to let everybody know that uh, TX Radio is going to be at MAPS, which is the truck show in March, March 30th through April 1st. If you're planning on attending MAPS or if you need some information, you can always contact us at info at tncradio.live, and we can see about gaining you VIP tickets. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Thanks for listening to Taillights with the Bombs.